for those that I haven't met, I'm Carolyn Ray. I'm the publisher of Journey Woman. And I'm so thrilled you're all here today. Um, I think this is a really fun topic for us to talk about and think about the future of travel and the kind of uh, travel lifestyle that we can that we can embrace in the future. And um, for those of you that might be new to Journey Woman, we're the uh, original solo travel publication established in 1994 by Evelyn Hannon. And uh, our ethos is to empower women uh, and help you travel safely and well. We um, have been running this year travel ready sessions. And though we did one in January on travel essentials and finances and legal affairs, we did another one in, uh, in February on downsizing for travel. Um, and, then, um, and then this one, next month we're doing one on solo travel safety. And uh, we also have our 28th anniversary coming up in April and we're going to have a celebration for that. So stay tuned uh, for that as well, because there's a lot, of, a lot of fun things coming up. Um, with regard to this session, I, um, you know, I started downsizing about three years ago and now live in a very small place and have been getting ready for travel as we all have been. And, um, and, and we've been doing kind of pulse surveys with you to get your, uh, your thoughts and your feedback on what the future of travel looks like for you. And uh, one of the things that we learned in the last survey was that financial barriers are a big challenge for you. Well, for all of us really thinking about, you know, how do we manage budgets? How do we uh, afford to travel, take longer trips, plus all the changes that are happening in the world. So I reached out to, uh, to Nora, who, um, who I've known for a few years. She runs a website called The Professional Hobo. And, um, and she has actually traveled, she traveled before the pandemic for 12 years full time, went to 60 countries, and is going to share her expertise with us today about all the things that she learned. Um, she has um, two books on her website, and I'll put the links up for those as well. But one of them is called How to Get Free Accommodation Around the World. And the other one is, um, is about trains and slow travel. So she's, she's not only an expert and a certified financial planner or former certified uh, financial planner, but she's also an expert on slow travel. She has, um, like me, she sold everything she owned and uh, started traveling in 2006. And um, she survived three natural disasters, which I wanna hear about a little bit today. Um, and, um, has had all kinds of interesting uh, things happen to her from, you know, passport theft to um, uh, breakups, it sounds like, Nora. <laughs> yes, more but, than I care to admit to, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, she uh, she's worked in Peru, Ecuador, uh, South Africa, or, or I should say traveled. And, um, and so she's, we're going to talk today about different accommodation options, about how to travel on a budget, um, about some tips for solo travel safety and a whole bunch of other things. So I, I want to start off by asking Nora if you could share a bit of your story on how you, um, how this, how you became a full-time traveler when you started traveling in 2006 and, and what was behind all of that? Well, thank you, first of all, for such a uh, glowing introduction. Uh, and I have been a fan of the Journey Woman community for many, many years now. And uh, so it is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I think I'll jump right into the impetus for my full-time travel career. And it, I mean, it stemmed ultimately from a lifelong dream to crack the code of countries that I had visited. And that involved understanding how people play, uh, how they work, where they shop, what they cook, what they talk about around dinner tables, uh, and really what daily life is like in various destinations around the world. So my last traditional vacation was a month long trip to South Africa. And uh, people here in, in Canada looked at me like I was crazy for taking a whole month to, uh, to go somewhere. They thought, oh my gosh, that's irresponsible from, you know, what's gonna happen with your business when you're away? And I said, I think it's gonna be okay. And I got to South Africa and people had a very different narrative there. People would ask me, oh, how many months are you here for? 
And that opened my eyes to the idea and the concept that there are actually people uh, out there and actually a lot of people who will travel for months, two years at a time. And that it really is a North American affliction, uh, this, this short vacation time um, that really doesn't allow us to accomplish much in a trip. Now, through my time in South Africa, which, of course, I thought a month was long enough to crack the code. I mean, shouldn't it be? And of course, it wasn't. I returned to Canada with more questions than answers. And at the time I was 30 and I thought, well, you know, this is a, this is a really an ever nagging dream of mine that is getting louder and louder uh, by each day. And I thought I, I had to do it. I, I didn't know where it would lead, but I, I decided to take the leap of faith and sell everything that I own to travel full time. I didn't know how long it would last. Maybe it was just something I had to get out of my system. Uh, so I was as surprised as anyone else to realize and discover that I did manage to go for 12 years. Uh, I do have a home base again in Toronto from where I continue to travel for about six months of each year, pandemics notwithstanding, of course. Uh, and I've just survived 365 days in one place. I never anticipated that my home base in Toronto I'm would be kidding. one that I would be in for this long, but it served its purpose, that's for sure. Yeah. And what, um, what's a highlight that you could share with everybody about one of your most memorable travel experiences that you had in that time? Not the Toronto time you know, the more interesting, the more interesting times. You know, I've had so many amazing uh, life-changing experiences. Uh, certainly one that immediately comes to mind is I did spend two years apprenticing with a shaman in Peru, living in the Sacred Valley. Uh, and then I spent a year in Ecuador working as another shaman's assistant. So that was pretty cool. Uh, if I just wanted to pick mm -hmm. one experience off the top of my head. That sounds very cool. So we, we did a little survey, as I mentioned, one of our pulse surveys, um, which was um, looking at different types of accommodation. And what we heard um, in terms of what type uh, women prefer is house sitting rose to the top with about 46% and homestay. So, you know, Airbnbs, long-term uh, travel, uh, long-term rentals, that kind of thing. We also asked about um, pet sitting and sea travel and work exchanges and staying with friends and kind of all the different ways that we could travel that Nora, you know, uh, there's obviously a huge expense involved in, um, in accommodation. What would be um, your secret because you, you saved I think over $100,000 just figuring out the right kind of accommodation and the right, you know, the right at the right place at the right time. Um, what would be your overall tips on how do you choose the right um, the right place. So there are five main forms of free accommodation that you can take advantage of when you travel. Uh, the shortest term one would be couch surfing, uh, which is really just a kind of a, a label name, a, a brand name for hospitality exchanges. So there are many different websites where you can connect with uh, locals around the world and stay with them for a few days. Uh, there's also work exchange, which is volunteering in trade for free accommodation. I found that to be an incredibly rewarding experience and a way to plug into a local community and do some really rewarding work. Uh, it's not to be confused with volunteerism uh, in that um, not all the projects that you do when you're volunteering in trade for free accommodation are humanitarian in nature. In fact, most of them are helping local business owners uh, keep their places going. And one of the highlights that I did was uh, I actually volunteered at a retreat center in New Zealand, uh, which I actually came and went from for about six months. It was a very special experience, but I've done everything in trade for free accommodation from painting murals to designing marketing plans to uh, cooking and cleaning and uh, everything in between. House sitting is probably my favorite form of free accommodation uh, because it allows you to enjoy the comforts of home. It's just somebody else's home. And uh, in exchange for the free place to stay, you are taking care of uh, the person's home, their plants, their mail, their pets more often than not. Uh, and it's a, it's a great way to live a slice of local life. Uh, the downside can be, depending on the gig, it can actually be quite onerous. Sometimes they do require you to be on site uh, all the time or nearly all the time uh, as, a, as a security presence or, or, or what have you, whatever it is. Uh, and that can impede on the travel experience, depending on what you're looking for. I also lived on boats for three months in the Caribbean. I lived on five 
boats spanning three different countries in the Caribbean. And that was an incredible way to uh, actually conquer my fear of <laughs> the ocean, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, I suggest if you want to do something like that, you do have some sailing experience uh, because the environment has changed a little bit since I was doing that. But it was uh, an incredible experience in a very tight knit community uh, because uh, everyone knows everybody else when it comes to the nautical community. Uh, and the last form of free accommodation, which actually I haven't had a chance to sample because I had no home at the time, is home exchanges. Uh, and this is another brilliant way to be able to enjoy the comforts of home, uh, just somebody else's home from abroad. And, uh, and in exchange, or, uh, you, there is someone who's taking care of your place when you're away. And so it, it definitely works very well. It does not need to be a simultaneous exchange. Most home exchange websites realize that it would be very difficult to uh, arrange a simultaneous exchange. So you're, you're able to, you know, you, if you offer up your place, you earn points, and then you can use those points to stay in other people's homes. Uh, so those are the five forms of free accommodation. And indeed, I did save over $100,000 getting free accommodation around the world uh, in my first 10 years. That is abroad. amazing. That is amazing. We had, um, there, we've been having this discussion on our Facebook group about um, both volunteering and websites that we trust. And I wanted to share a few of those today. Um, one is homeexchange.com, uh, trusted house, sitter, house sitters. There's House uh, Post It Mexico. And then there are some new um, women only kinds of services. There's one called Go Lightly and Fem B, &B that, um, that I've spoken with both their CEOs, and you'll be reading about them in our next uh, in our next issue. But there seems to be a plethora of all kinds of new alternatives coming onto the market that I think will benefit us as women and give us more choice and really let us expand our, our horizons in terms of, you know not just going to a, a small boutique hotel or, or something like that. I can see in our, uh, our poll that's going on right now um, that the preference looks like homestay followed by boutique hotel. So, um, which is very consistent with the, um, with the surveys that we've done so far. So thank you all for, for filling that in. Um, the other area that we wanted to talk about and and I'm going to publish a list of, um, by the way, of uh, volunteering sites as well on our, uh, on our website. One of the ones that we've talked about a lot is Semester at Sea, uh, which many, many in the, in the Journey Woman community have tried out and highly recommend. Uh, Serve Us was recommended in our, actually we discussed it in our last book club, um, where we talked about that as an option with Travels With My Hat. And we have several others that um, that I'll post in an article. But I want to move now on to you know the whole concept of slow travel and thinking about um, you know the the whole idea of staying in a place longer, going deeper into the culture. And uh, actually, we're going to be focusing on this in our first uh, April issue quite a bit. But um, in interviewing Pauline Kenny, who who is considered the founder of uh, slow travel. But you know, it's something I'm really looking at now that I've downsized, now that I've gotten rid of everything and live in a small space. I want, I'd like to leave for like a year and just um, stay in a country for long periods of time and see what that feels like. What would be your, you know, your recommendations on how to do that from a budget perspective? Is there any, any tips on how to keep costs down when you travel, when you, um, when you think about the different options that we can, that we can uh, look at? You know, the very act of slow travel is a money saving initiative uh, in that the fewer times that you are changing your location and getting on planes, trains, buses, taxis and whatnot, uh, the less money you're spending. Also, generally speaking, the longer you stay in a place, the more uh, discounted that accommodation will be. And as well, if you're staying in a place that has, for example, a kitchen, uh, you have the ability, if you're staying there for a while, to buy some groceries and cook some meals in. So all of those, that's the trifecta of money saving in terms of the slow travel experience. And personally, I find slow travel infinitely more rewarding uh, because it is, a, it is a way to just go a little bit deeper into the culture and to meet some people, make some inroads, and not feel that you always need to move on to the next destination. 
I also think it's important to note that uh, post pandemic, I think that people are going to choose to travel slower and slower. We don't honestly, nobody really knows what travel is going to look like in, you know, two, three, five years. Uh, but certainly in the near future, anybody who is traveling in the next two years is probably going to be facing things like uh, possible quarantine periods where they need to stay somewhere for a while. So uh, it, it inherently will uh, mean that more people are, will be traveling slower and slower. And I think that that that, that's not only beneficial for the traveler, but it's also beneficial for the destinations to, to be able to stay somewhere for a while and not just pass through from a cursory level. Yeah. So what are some, what are some tips you might have on how do you do, how do you file your taxes? How do you manage your banking? How do you, how do you look after things at home when you're so far away? Uh, yeah, well, I've got practically an entire website dedicated to that. So uh, there are many things uh, that people that, that need to be addressed before you go away. So if you're going to go away for uh, more than a month or even a few months, uh, one of the main things that people uh, speak to me about or ask me about is what do I do with my mail? How do I get my mail when, uh, when I'm away? Uh, and there are lots of services that are uh, designed to help you with this. They're called virtual mailing services. And basically you set this up as your address. Uh, and the mail will come to them and they will send you an email when you get mail. Uh, and you can tell them to, um, they'll scan, you can, they'll, you can tell them to open it and they'll scan it and send it to you. Uh, or you can tell them to scrap it or forward it directly to you. So that way you don't miss any mail that comes in while you're traveling. Who gets uh, mail though? I want to ask that. Like <laughs> the only mail, the only mail I get anymore is bank statements, but really, I mean, it makes it so much easier now because everything's electronic, right? Absolutely. But uh, wouldn't you, uh, you know, feel uh, amiss if you missed, uh, if you were gone for a year, as you will be, uh, and uh, you missed, uh, you know, something from the CRA telling you that you needed to, uh, I don't know, file an extra return or a driver's license renewal, uh, or a, a letter from your credit card tel company telling you that, uh, you know, you've been compromised. In many cases, we have been able to take 80, 90% even of our things online, but we still haven't been able to entirely get rid of the mailing address. Yeah, yeah. There's a question here, Nora, around maintaining permanent residence for mm -hmm. government benefits. I don't know if that's something you can answer or not. Uh, certainly from a Canadian uh, perspective, uh, I can answer that in that because I was never a resident of any other country, I remained what's called a factual resident of Canada. So uh, that basically meant for tax purposes, I, I claimed my Canadian taxes, my worldwide income on my Canadian tax return every year. Uh, and that uh, allowed me to maintain my residence in Canada. Uh, my permanent residence has always been uh, in Canada. Uh, the only thing that happened was because I was out of the province, or out of the country, uh, for more than uh, a certain period of time, I think it was six months, I did lose my provincial coverage, uh, which then is a, a, a whole other ball of wax when it comes to having the proper insurance. Uh, perfect segue. That's our next topic. Hey, <laughs> perfect. It's like I knew. Um, so let's talk about insurance because uh, we, we did do a session on this in January, as I mentioned. Uh, I feel like so much has changed ever, even since we did that. I mean, uh, we did talk about, you know, some of the terminology and, uh, and whatnot, which is, again, on our site for folks to look at. But um, uh, you need to know your trip. You need to know your policy. You need to know your health. You need to know how long you're going to be away. What else would you, would you suggest in terms of in terms of insurance and choosing the right insurance, especially for long-term travel. Well, when we get into the realm of long-term travel, uh, as I was uh, just alluding to earlier, uh, the challenge is if you lose, as Canadians, if you lose your provincial coverage, then you no longer qualify for traditional travel insurance. Uh, so your options then uh, are a little more limited, uh, but there are still options. And those options are international health insurance policies, also known as expat insurance. And this is, this is like a health insurance policy that follows you wherever you go around the world. Now, personally, uh, I didn't need a full health plan like that covered doctor's visits and, and prescriptions and whatnot, uh, because that would be very expensive. So I actually designed my plan so that it had a very high deductible. And what that did was it kept my monthly premiums much lower. So my intention with that was to use it as I would use travel insurance, which is to say if I had a medical emergency abroad. 
Uh, and the, the beautiful thing that you do discover when you travel abroad is uh, much of the time uh, outside of North America, uh, medical costs actually can be things like doctor's visits and prescriptions can actually be quite inexpensive. So I would just pay for those sort of expenses with cash and save my expat insurance policy for travel emergencies. Nora, do you have any recommendations on websites or places people can go to compare travel insurance or, or look at different options? Well, well, I do write about it quite a bit on my website. Uh, and in fact, actually, this coming Monday, I am publishing a brand new COVID friendly post uh, about travel insurance and health insurance options for long term travelers. Uh, and it's one that uh, is going to be profiling a company that I've recently discovered uh, called Safety Wing. Uh, which uh, could well be a cost-effective options uh, for many people here. Yeah, and the other one I've heard about um, that's been recommended by some of the women in our advisory council is squaremouth.com, which uh, is also U.S. and uh, includes uh, includes a, a coverage from all, all the different com companies. And I think the challenge, you know, some of the challenge here is how do you find the right insurance for uh, 65 and over? And, um, and obviously um, some companies cover that and some don't, but it, it just feels like insurance right now is so fluid to me. Uh, one, one day there's a, there's a COVID uh, coverage and the next day there's not. And uh, with all the changes that keep happening uh, with airlines and country borders and everything else, it's, um, it's a confusing area for sure. And I know one that, that we, need to keep, um, we need to keep on top of for sure. It's daunting to say the least, uh, and it's all the more reason to read your, I know it's a soul destroying task, but read your policy cover to cover uh, and make sure that you understand it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, one of the other things that you and I talked about was around protecting your identity when you travel. And uh, we've all had those experiences where we've had problems with ATM cards or visas or uh, you know bank machines and everything else. And then you worry that uh, something's happened, something's been compromised, but any, any stories or, you know, even like, you know, things that aren't so pretty that you could share with us about, about that side of things and making sure that you're protecting your identity when you travel. Well, I, I'll share a story and a tip. Uh, and the story was uh, I had arrived in Switzerland for a three month house sitting gig uh, when I received an email uh, from my credit card company saying, please call us as soon as possible. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Okay. So I called the credit card company and they said, have you by any chance made $8,000 of purchases on eBay? Did you buy $8,000 worth of Halloween costumes? And I said, mm, nope, that would not be me. And they said, okay, we thought so. Uh, so we've frozen your credit card. It seems that it's been compromised. Uh, and then they, they launched into a process that they're obviously very well versed in where they, they canceled my card uh, and they immediately shipped out a new card to me in Switzerland, which I received in two days. Uh, and that, so basically I was only two days out in terms of uh, being without a credit card. I do use my credit card as much as possible while I am traveling uh, for just this reason. Uh, sometimes you will find that um, you charge something abroad and, it, and the credit card is declined. Uh, and if you place a call into your credit card company and say, hey, I just tried to charge something abroad and it was declined, they may say, oh, well, it's a, um, we flagged it because we weren't sure whether or not it was a, 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 a logistical pur purchase. And this can happen regardless of whether or not you notify your bank of your travels. It's generally good practice to notify your bank and say, I'm going to be in this country from this date to this date, but it doesn't always circumvent the automatic flagging system. I don't mind it though because it's keeping me safe and it's keeping my finances safe. And when a uh, when your identity is compromised and for example, uh, $8,000 worth of Halloween purchase costumes are purchased, you're not held responsible for that. Whereas if you're using your debit card for everything and your debit card is compromised, that money is going to come right out of your bank account and there's very little to any recourse. So for mm -hmm. that reason, I really do like using credit cards and making sure that that's the first card that comes out of my wallet. Uh, two identity protection, I, I lied, two, I'm going to provide two identity protection tips, one of which is RFID protected purses and wallets. Uh, I was in Ireland a couple of years ago and I, I whipped out a, a, a wallet and, and with a, 
a card and I was tapping to pay a bill. And uh, the fellow said, geez, you know, do you have RFID protection in that wallet? He said, because that's a, that's a, that's a big problem now. If you can tap that, then someone can walk by you with an RFID reader and they can steal your identity. And they can do this with your passport, your debit card, your credit card, because they all have these chips in them now. Uh, and an airport is a, is a rife environment for someone to do that. They literally have to walk by you with this scanner in their pocket and they can get all of your information. So your purse, your wallet uh, need to have RFID protection and you need to keep your credit cards and passports in this all the time. When you My say second... RFID protection, do you mean an actual thing like that the, the, the passport goes in or what, what does that mean? Is it a, is it a tag or, or what is it? So most wallets, purses, passport wallets uh, generally have this built in now uh, and it, it's almost invisible. You wouldn't know that it's even there uh, as an RFID protection, but you, you would know, you'd know it's there because there will be some sort of label on the wallet or, or purse saying that they are RFID protected pockets. Now, if you have a purse that you really like to use and it doesn't have RFID protection, you can buy little sleeves. And it's just like a, for your passport, for example, it's like a paper sleeve. It looks like a piece of paper, but you slip your passport into it and it is RFID protected. So I think I actually have one of these, which is a pack safe. Yes. Does that have our, okay, I love it. It's a little city bag. And, um, and it's got all the locks and everything on it to make it tricky for people to get into your get into your backpack. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know it had RFID. So there you go. I adore PackSafe. I am a poster child for PackSafe. I've been using their products for uh, well over a decade. Now, the entire bag itself is not RFID protected. It will only be certain pockets within the bag. And you will see in the bag, there will be a little label indicating which of those pockets is RFID protected. So you'll, you'll definitely know. And the only things you really need to put in there are, like I said, anything that has a chip in it, like, um, like credit cards and passports. Now, my second tip is regarding uh, identity protection online. Because if you're traveling long term, you're going to need to do things like get into your bank account and pay your bills, uh, check your emails, uh, really just do the tasks of life online. And uh, the cold hard reality of it is even if you are using a password protected Wi Fi connection, as in a cafe or in a hotel, those passwords are, are, are not recycled often enough in that anyone who has ever been in that cafe or stayed in that hotel has the ability to log into your computer while you're using that connection and, and read everything on your computer. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it can be the, 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 the ease. I actually watched a terrifying video of a, a little girl, a seven-year-old girl sitting in an airport who managed to watch a video and hack into someone's computer who was sitting next to her in the airport. So it is not rocket science and it can be done and it is done more frequently than we would ever suspect. So there is a solution and that solution is using a VPN which is short for a virtual private network. Uh, it's very easy. I'm personally, I've used, uh, I don't know, about half a dozen different uh, VPNs. My fan is, my favorite one is Nord, N-O-R-D, Nord VPN. Uh, it's very inexpensive. It's a couple of dollars a month. You can protect all of your devices. And whenever you log into any kind of Wi-Fi connection, anywhere <laughs> other than the one in your own home that you obviously is very protected, uh, then uh, all you have to do is just click a button. And then what it does is it masks, protects your, masks your IP address uh, so no one can hack into your computer or your phone. That's great advice. Um, I, use, I use Bitdefender, which I think does the same thing, but is probably a little more expensive and, and geared at com small companies, I think. But uh, those are... <laughs> Bitdefender is is uh, primarily an antivirus uh, program as well, but they have a VPN option on yeah, top of it. Do. Yeah. So, um, so those are some great tips. I'm wondering if folks have any questions they'd like to ask Nora, because we we kind of went quickly through the accommodations, and I I personally would like to go back to that and dig a little deeper into into hearing some of your, you know, um, when we talked about boats and and uh, different more unique places that you've stayed. Um, what else comes to mind for you other than the, um, you, you mentioned the boat experience, but are there any other places you stayed that were kind of unique and different that it, Certainly I can say that uh, <laughs> I, 
the the quality uh, and also the quirkiness of many of the places that I've stayed in uh, that I've gotten free accommodation in have been really amazing. Uh, and it's a misnomer to assume that if you're getting free accommodation that it, you are roughing it. Uh, because that is as actually in some cases cannot be farther from the truth. Uh, I did a three month house sitting gig in Panama where I was staying in a <laughs> multi million dollar uh, place uh, that was absolutely gorgeous. I, I would sit on the, their open veranda that overlooked the pool and go toucan spotting every morning uh, as I sipped my coffee. Um, when I was volunteering in Australia and trade for free accommodation, it was at a 300 hectare animal sanctuary and uh, uh, property that had cottages for guests to stay in. So uh, my job was to uh, help tend some of the land. You know, I was like chopping firewood and raking and, and cleaning the, uh, the cottages. And in exchange for that, I received, a, I was staying in a bluestone cottage uh, in, the, in this beautiful valley on 300 hectares of property with llamas and donkeys and horses. And, and I had a kangaroo actually that followed me around. Literally this kangaroo fell in love with me and followed me around for six months straight. So, uh, you know, those are just two random experiences uh, that I've had in getting free accommodation around the world. So they, they, the opportunities vary uh, greatly, uh, but certainly you needn't sacrifice style if that's important to you. So there's a question here from Kate about how do you find these places, Nora? What's your, what's your secret there? So there are a variety of websites depending on what you're looking for. Uh, and this is something that I, I do go into great detail on my website, which is the professionalhobo.com. I have an article about getting free and cheap accommodation. And I've also written a book called How to Get Free Accommodation Around the World. It's costs less than cheeseburger and will pay for itself in your first night on the road. Uh, and in that, I, I mean, there are literally dozens of websites. If you want to house sit, uh, it depends on uh, where you want to house sit and what kind of gigs you want. But there are, there are 15 different websites that you could use. If you want to volunteer, again, there's at least seven websites that you can use, and it depends on the kinds of gigs that you want. Uh, so, you know, same thing for boats, same thing for hospitality exchanges. And the, the, largest number of websites are for home exchanges that that's insane. I mean, there's dozens of home exchange websites. So, mm -hmm. which also makes it harder to choose uh, which one, which is why we want to um, get some recommendations from people and, and make those available to everybody. Um, I see Linda's got a question about which countries and places are best to travel as we work our way out of the pandemic. What trusted source? Linda, I'm not sure if that means to find a homestay or just generally which places are best to travel to if you want to type in type it in generally which places are best to travel with so maybe even um, based on your experience Nora maybe just speaking about what countries you felt the safest in um, when you traveled I mean are we talking about safety as a traveler or, or safety from the pandemic well I meant as a pre-pandemic obviously but um, you know, going forward, that's, it's a little harder to answer. Yeah. Um, so I, I've definitely safety on the road. I mean, it really, it's, um, it depends on how you view things. Uh, certainly there, you know, I've spoken with many Americans who will say that, that you know, the most dangerous place to be is home. Uh, and in fact, actually the rest of the world is, is infinitely safer, statistically speaking, uh, than uh, the States are. Uh, so it, it really depends on your context. Uh, however, as a traveler, as a solo female traveler, there are a variety of techniques you can employ that will keep you safe on the road. And a lot of it boils down to street sense, uh, as well as, Mm, talking to locals. So when I was in Colombia, I stayed with a family in Bogota. And the first thing I did was I asked the family, is there anything that I need to know in order to stay safe? Uh, and they gave me all kinds of tips. Well, first of all, they said, oh, no, it's totally safe. My kids have walked around here at night all alone and da, 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 da. Uh, and then after she went through that preamble, she, she listed a number of things. She said, but of course, when you use a taxi, you do this, this, and this. And they were things that I'd never heard of doing when you use a taxi, but they became tips that I was able to use uh, in the future. So there certainly are, uh, and there's a lot of tips. I mean, I can certainly start to <laughs> rattle off yeah. a bunch of these tips, but ultimately really it boils down to street sense. Yeah. Yeah. And goodness knows we have uh, almost 30 years of safety tips on our website. So, so lots to draw on from there. Um, I think, I think one of the most interesting I heard, it was on one of our book club calls and we were talking about, you know, these books where 
about women that went out on their own, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And um, with, I think, such courage um, and basically, you know, just used maps and asked their way around. Uh, but one of the, one of the uh, great tips I heard was to make lunch your dinner and uh, just be, be cautious uh, with alcohol in the evening. And of course, Evelyn talked all the time about what to wear, what to pack. Those are all important safety tips um, to consider when you're, when you're a woman traveling alone. Um, I wanted to, uh, I don't know if there are any other questions for Nora that we could go through. The, the only other thing I wanted to ask you, I wanted to maybe circle back to volunteering a little bit um, because I, I know there were some more comments put in the, in the post here about other uh, websites where you can find volunteering opportunities. And I'm gonna go back to my list um, and pull those up again. But um, Nora, what was your experience with, um, with volunteering and the, the good and the bad? Any, any tips there to share? So I, I would say that it was probably one of my favorite ways of getting free accommodation because uh, there was it was such a grab bag of possibilities. Uh, and there were, you know, there's anything from, you know, working on organic farms to, uh, you know, working in, in on people's properties and in wineries and in resorts and, and retreat centers. And I, there, I mean, I, I'm not even doing justice by, by limiting it to that selection. There are so many different ways you can volunteer in trade for free accommodation. And there are, a, a, again, many different websites that you can use to find said opportunities. Uh, but the one that I would probably use, uh, it wasn't around when I was is doing my volunteering, but this is uh, my go-to now is called World Packers. Uh, and this provides a, a wide range of volunteer opportunities where you can volunteer and trade for free accommodation. Uh, but one of the, the many things I like about it is it also has a way to filter for uh, eco uh, opportunities and social impact opportunities. So these are, are, are opportunities for volunteering that have a humanitarian bent to it, uh, but it still afford you free accommodation and sometimes meals as well. You definitely get plugged into a community. Now, the cons are, uh, or <laughs> cautionary tales uh, would be, it's very important to do your due diligence before you accept an opportunity, uh, because it, it can be, <laughs> you don't know what you're going to get into until you get there. So it's important to have a call with the people and understand what the gig is going to be, understand what's expected of you. Uh, because, you know, I, I was in Hawaii on, um, on a permaculture property where I only had to work an hour a day. I was in New Zealand working on a resort, uh, uh, sorry, in a, at a retreat center where I had to work 25 hours a week. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a pretty wide variety of, of things. Uh, I also had a reader who told me about a, a gig that she did where she, I think it was in Australia, but I, don't quote me on that. She arrived at this gig and realized that thinking that there were going to be a lot of volunteers and that this was a fairly large property. And she arrived there only just to, to discover that actually it was a very small property owned by one man. And uh, she was unfortunately uh, made quite uncomfortable. She didn't have uh, enough privacy. Uh, it was, she was kind of forced into a situation where she had to live and dine and recreate with this man who was uh, ultimately kind of difficult to get along with. And it was rural. So uh, it, it, the story ended fine. She was absolutely okay, but it's one of those situations that could go sideways. Uh, and so it is very important to do your due diligence before you go uh, and make sure that you're going into something that you're, you're prepared for. Yeah, I mean, our, our surveys show that we're, we are gonna see some shifts in, in I think, uh, toward more intentional travel and purposeful travel where we wanna go out into the world and, and be helpful and do our part, especially in small communities. So I, I do think this is going to be a uh, an ongoing discussion of where to find uh, where to find those opportunities. Um, one of the other sites that was mentioned was Workaway, um, uh, which I've heard now from a few people. And there's one called All Hearts and Hands, uh, which uh, I actually looked into the last time I was in Puerto Rico, and uh, looked at volunteering there on a farm. Um, I ended up doing World Central Kitchen, which is slightly different than what you're talking about. But, but I, you know, I would almost encourage everyone if you're if you're thinking about travel at all, make sure you build that into your trip and make sure we do something to help these um, help these small communities, um, you know, get back into um, uh, help with their quality of life. 
Um, there's a question here about when do we think we'll be able to get back on planes? And, um, and I know that's a tricky one and I'm not sure if it's coming from the States or Canada. Um, unfortunately, Canada's rollout is a little bit slower than what's happening in the US right now. Uh, but um, the other thing to remember is a lot of the countries we wanna to go to may not be ready for us. So uh, especially because so many people want to go to smaller places that are off the beaten trail, so to speak. Um, we're seeing all kinds of changes with airlines uh, you know, the airline industry, I think I saw something today about another airline that may not make it. So there's going to be some very um, uh, serious shifts happening in travel that will influence how long it takes us to get places, how much it costs, um, and, and the kinds of places we can get to quickly, which, again, I think is all an impetus for really embracing uh, longer stays and uh, I think a more authentic way of travel, which I'm, which I'm excited about. Um, if there are not any other questions for Nora, and she's still here, I want to invite Kate to, um, to come in because, and thank you, Nora, so much. This has been great. No uh, problem. Thank you. I just want to invite Kate to, I'm going to try and find you, Kate, and unmute you. So Kate was um, one of the women that I interviewed for one of our um, There we go. Kate, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. okay. Uh, for one of our issues, and Kate's got a really interesting story about how she downsized and then the kind of lifestyle that she embraced. And Kate, I wondered if you could share that with folks. Well, following Nora, I, I have to say, it's like, you know, my story, Nora had so much information and I'm still kind of swirling with that. But I, I speak more to the later in life travelers. You know, I didn't start traveling until I was 50. And it's such a, an unusual story because I got married and then divorced at 28, which is, you know, so unusual. But, um, you know, you come out of that. And when you've been married that long, uh, you know, my, my, I call him my husband, he wanted to race boats and I wanted to sail boats. So that tells you right there, there was a whole difference. But coming out of that at 50, you know, you're essentially trying to find yourself and figure it out. And you kind of lick your wounds and come out of it. And I just decided I was going to have a year, and this was 15 years ago, a year of yes. And I was going to say yes to everything. And there's been books about that written since, but in my own mind, it's just like, I got to get out of my own way and decide what I wanted to do. And I love to dance and I love to, I love live music and I wanted to learn to sail. And I was lucky enough that a person introduced me to something. We have something here called the Seattle Singles Yacht Club, which is an, a kind of an unusual thing. And it sounds really fancy, but it's not. It's very, basically it's single people, 50 and over that have boats and they're single. So they want people to help crew on those boats. So that was one of the hardest things I ever did was walking up those stairs by myself into this room of people. I mean, I've been married my whole life, basically. And I walked in and here's a hundred people my age wanting to go and do. And it was just wonderful because what they would do is charter, it's called bare boat chartering. And they would charter in other countries and then we would be the crew. So we would all fly down to whatever country we were going to. We'd provision the boats. And so that kind of took care of worrying about accommodation. Although, you know, you, you come in, you have to come in a few days beforehand. You, you've got to stay somewhere. And uh, so I got to do, to do that. And my first trip was the British Virgin Islands. And in one of my yeses, I had said yes to a, a job, a brand new job that was way beyond me. And I was, and I still said, I'm going to go on this trip. I don't care what it takes. <laughs> and I was lucky enough to have a, a woman boss who had actually done a lot of this kind of traveling. And she said, absolutely, you should go. And that was the start of it. So with this club, um, I've gone, you know, to Croatia, to Thailand a couple times, to, uh, oh, where else? Cro uh, well, uh, an offshoot was then five other women uh, and we have three or four boats together. 
So we would get to go to islands that no one else got to see because we had a small boat. But uh, five other women and I decided that we would like to try traveling together. So we, <laughs> we rented a barge in France. And I say we, we kind of stormed Paris and barged the canals. We had so much fun. But we had this big fat houseboat. I mean, it wasn't those sleek river boats that you see. We would watch those go by where they're being served drinks and all that. But we're the crew. It's five women. We're the crew. So we did that and just went from, from uh, middle of France down to the south of France. And we'd always some would break off and do something else after we got off the boat. We turned the boat in and it was just a comfortable way to start learning how to travel with other friends. Yeah. So, what would your what would your advice be to, you know, somebody who might like to try that who loves I mean, I love the water. I I, I all your stories of sailing around Croatia and Spain and just I'm like, yes, I'm there. How do I do it? Uh, well, what would be your advice to somebody that wants to try that who may not live in Seattle? <laughs> you know, it's just find like-minded people and boaters, that community, it's one of the friendliest, most helpful communities. And I, <laughs> what I learned in, in our group was it, they were uh, drinkers with a boating problem. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a very lively kind of group on the water. And, you know, in Canada, I would imagine I believe in Vancouver, there's some kind of a group like that, but they're around. It's like in Seattle, it's one of the best kept secrets. And I don't know why, you know, and we've gone up in the San Juans. I've flown by float plane up to Princess Luisa and it's stunning and gotten off the float plane. And I, I didn't even know if the boat was going to be there that I was meeting and they were there. And it was, you know, you just, you, you start asking. You put yourself out, you say, this is what I'm going to do. And you start thinking about how, how you would meet those people if you don't want to buy a boat. But you can, like there's, we rent the boat. So you go down to, um, uh, you just, you look online and there's two different, basically two different places that rent boats. And you can rent, I mean, if you want to have a captain, you can have a captain and he will take you. And or you should start that way. <laughs> kind of nice we didn't get to have that but we were it. there's nothing like provisioning a boat in thailand because you know we think about going to the store so you go to the store well, nothing's in english you have no idea half the time what you're buying so we had some interesting meals yeah that's and, lovely you know, yeah and going on a, you know doing the barge i would say do that start there you know in countries because it's it's not a lot of skill on the water. You're not looking at tides. You're not looking at all the things you have to be aware of. You're going down a canal. But to do it woman only, those countries just, I mean, the women in, in most of those countries don't do that kind of thing. They're at home. For the men, they go boating. That's their fishing lodge. You know, they, they get a group of men together and they go boating. So if you're single, go to those marinas let me tell you it's like shooting fish in a barrel walking down that dock <laughs> there's just boats full of guys I, I, think, kidding. I think that's a different webinar than this one but but thank you <laughs> oh, um, I, I, yeah. I want to invite i want to invite christine now to uh, to share her story christine i'm going to try and find you thank you so much kate that was great um and christine um lives in mexico and Kate, if I could ask you to mute yourself, that would be I'm great. Hi. <laughs> um, and um, Christine was also in the the article that I wrote um, a few weeks ago, and she she went a different path, which was more of a backpacking <laughs> and nomadic um, kind of lifestyle. But Christine, tell us a bit about that, and how did you how did you get to Mexico, and uh, what inspired you to go there? Well, I've I've always I've always been a backpacker a solo backpacker all over everywhere because I, I like traveling on my own. Um, Mexico, South America, Latin America was always uh, uh, an interest because my theory was go as far as I can for as long as I can for as cheap as I can. So I would always plan four to six weeks of I'm landing here and I'm exiting here and then I'd 
figure out the path um, that I was going to do. Um, it's always been, it's just always been the style that I've traveled. That's the way it is. Um, how I ended up here. Um, well, I downsized several times because I've moved across Canada twice. So the first time Toronto to Vancouver with nine boxes. Um, and I sold, gave away, stuck it on the street, whatever, all my stuff. And then the second time was uh, Vancouver to Prince Edward Island to open a bed and breakfast with my sister. And again, I sold, packed up, and this time seven boxes went. Um, and then it, well, well, it didn't quite work out with me and my sister. So um, I basically packed my backpack um, to go to a friend's place in Nova Scotia for a weekend, thinking I'm just going to go for a long weekend and that's it. And that turned into, please take me to the airport. I'm, I'm not going back to PEI, I'm going to Mexico. And I ended up in Mexico with basically a backpack of summer clothing for, you know, the weekend, you know, four pairs of underwear, a couple of t-shirts and um, ended up here. I've been here two and a half years. Um, and like Nora has said, I think I froze. No, you're okay. Oh, like maybe. Nora has said, um, oh, am I back? Yeah, back. I froze. Back. I froze. I'm sorry. Um, um, like Nora said, a big biggest thing was to cover accommodations because I kind of came without money or anything. So. I rented a very cheap uh, Airbnb for a month. And then I was applying for work in the hostels, pet sitting, house sitting, and I ended up with doing some home care. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for coming tonight. We, um, we, we'll be making a donation to uh, Ernestine's uh, Women's Shelter here in Toronto, uh, which we've been doing now for a few weeks and helping, uh, helping women and children. And we do this with all of our events just trying to give back to, um, to communities where we can and, and help other women and children uh, in this time. So uh, I wanna thank you all for coming. There is a, um, a feedback uh, form on our site. I appreciate and value your feedback. And, uh, and thank you again uh, for coming. And Nora, thanks so much for your expert advice.